Hello, and welcome to Epidemiology, one of the most exciting and fastest growing of the medical sciences. Of course, I'm biased. I'm an epidemiologist, but maybe after you hear a little bit about it, you'll feel the same way as me. The thing about epidemiology that makes it so fascinating is, first of all, in my opinion, it's the only medical science that probably doesn't involve a lot of medicine. And also, some epidemiologists are sort of like medical detectives. They're on the ground collecting data, talking to people, solving mysteries about what causes diseases in a population. It can be quite sexy, quite exciting. Kind of like uh, a police investigator except around medicine. So today, we're going to learn about the differences between descriptive and analytical studies in epidemiology. We're going to learn a little bit about the historical origins of epidemiology, where it came from, and maybe even where it's going. And we're also going to learn a little bit about the triumphs of epidemiology because I think it's important to brag a little bit about the things that we've done for society over the last couple of hundred years. So when we talk about epidemiology, it's traditional to define it first. It's difficult to define, however. This is one particularly popular definition. is offered by the Centers for Disease Control in Atlantic, Georgia. And uh, they say that epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of disease or health status in a population. Okay. Wikipedia offers a little more complicated definition, calling it the branch of medicine that deals with incidence, distribution, and so forth. I would add in prevalence and mortality and so forth. It gets complicated pretty fast and pretty dry. Most textbook definitions of epidemiology land somewhere between the two poles of the CDC and Wikipedia. I will offer you another definition. In my opinion, it's the science of science. Or if you want to be a little drier, it's the science of looking at the health of populations rather than of individuals. Hopefully this will all be clearer to you when we're done the lecture. Our story begins in the early 19th century in London, England, when a man named John Snow, whose name you might have heard of, decided to investigate a cholera outbreak that was happening in London at the time. Now, back then, we didn't know a lot about what caused diseases. There was a few uh, theories. Some were more fantastical than others, but there wasn't a lot of evidence to support many of the theories. John Snow's innovation was that he was going to use maps and numbers to describe the epidemic, the outbreak. Now, to us today, that seems kind of rational, kind of boring, kind of everyday. Back then, it was revolutionary. So what he did was he figured out that back in London in the 19th century, several neighborhoods were being served by water pumping stations. And he reasoned that probably cholera was waterborne. And he took the time to figure out which pumping stations were providing what water to what neighborhoods. His investigation led him to conclude that one particular pump, the Broad Street pump, was likely responsible for most of the cholera outbreaks in that city. You can go to London today and actually visit the Broad Street pump. There's a plaque there that says, this is the spot where epidemiology was born, or something like that. It's quite fascinating. I encourage you to go if you can. Let's look a little bit at um, the history of, of the disease before we continue. Before Jon Snow and his brethren made their innovations and discoveries, it was thought that diseases were caused by miasma. What's miasma? It's some kind of fantastical, poisonous, magical vapor or mist that would emanate from swamps of the ground, and people would shut their windows at night so it didn't get into their houses and cause them to be sick, and it had a foul smell associated with it. Miasma doesn't really exist. We know that today because we know that diseases are caused by infectious agents microbes, pathogens, bacteria, viruses. And we know this because around the same time that Jon Snow was making his investigations, the microscope made his first appearance, and we could see these microbes in action. So it was a revolutionary time. Let's look a little bit at the data that Jon Snow collected. He looked at the number of houses being served by a variety of pumping companies, the Southwark and Vauxhall Company, the Lambeth Company, and other companies in London. He saw that uh, each was servicing a different number of houses, and he counted the number of deaths from cholera experienced by those neighborhoods. To most people, the number of deaths alone were sufficient to tell the story. But that's not where Jon Snow stopped. He divided the number of deaths by the number of houses being served in each neighborhood and got a quotient, a ratio, a proportion. Again, to us today, that's an obvious thing to do. Back then, it was a revolutionary. It was an innovation. And by looking at 
the quotient, the proportion, he discovered that a majority of deaths were being caused by one particular pumping station, and he narrowed it down to one pump, the Broad Street pump. And today, that's why we have the science of epidemiology. It's the science of using non-medical tools, mathematics, paper, your mind, your hands, your feet, to learn something about disease that otherwise you would not have known. So today we have different kinds of epidemiologists. I mentioned that John Snow was a kind of outbreak investigator, a medical detective of some kind. Most physicians who are epidemiologists are clinical epidemiologists, and they bring to bear a variety of perspectives. They bring to bear the choices made by their patients, the, the clinical research and practice experience that they have, and also the experiences of their uh, mentors to make decisions for small groups of people, usually in a clinical environment. Public health epidemiologists are people like John Snow. These are the individuals who investigate outbreaks, who figure out which sandwich at the picnic gave you diarrhea, who figure out what's probably causing that, causing that outbreak of, of disease in that community over there. They're also the ones who plan the vaccine schedules for a community. And population epidemiologists look at large disease trends in a population, the incidence and prevalence, the risk factors that cause diseases, and so forth. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap and all these different types of epidemiologists, and there are newer emerging types of epidemiologists today. Epidemiology is forging partnerships with political science, with economics, with computer science and genetics. It's a fast evolving and diversifying science. So before I continue, I want to talk about how we know what we know. It's important to understand where our discipline fits into the science of knowing. We call this paradigms, paradigms of research, paradigms of knowing. When we talk about paradigms, we're talking about how our discipline interacts with the world and understands knowledge and evidence and truth. There are several dimensions to a paradigm, and I'll suggest to you that there are three main pillars philosophically of how to define a paradigm. The first is ontology, and that's how we, how we experience reality. Is reality defined by my imagination or your imagination? Or is your reality defined by some objective truth of a universe? Then we deal with epistemology, and that's how we acquire and process knowledge. Do we know about the universe from interrogating it, from talking to people, from collecting data? And then we have our methodology. Maybe the ways in which we design our studies, that determines how we understand the universe. The important part about all this is that paradigms of research allow us to define how the world works and how we extract knowledge from it. A psychologist, a political scientist, an economist, an anthropologist, and an epidemiologist interact with the world a bit differently and define knowledge a bit differently. We define the questions that we ask a bit differently as well. When we look at evidence-based medicine, we're going to phrase a research question and the paradigm of knowledge from which we arise helps us define the types of questions that we can ask. Our paradigm of research also tells us what is publishable and what isn't because it defines what constitutes knowledge, what constitutes proper evidence. And epidemiology is, I hope you will conclude with me, all about how we rank evidence and understand truth. In essence, a paradigm tells us how the world is structured and tells us what determines meaning and significance. Epidemiology exists within something we call the etiologic paradigm, which is a kind of positivism. And it purports that there exists external objective truth that we can access via our, our methodologies, our science, our study designs. And we can measure risk factors and things that cause outcomes. Smoking causes cancer. This behavior will cause this other kind of outcome. That's the nature of the epidemiologic etiologic paradigm. I bring this up because it's important that we remember that epidemiology, and any discipline for that matter, is but one path to knowledge. There are a variety of paths to knowledge. Different disciplines have their own paths. It's important that we don't descend into arrogance when we consider the evidence that we choose to base our medical decision making on. So let's now change gears a bit and talk about terminology. It's important that we get our, our words straight before we can talk more deeply about epidemiology and how to use it. When we're in mathematics versus clinical research versus laboratory research versus epidemiology, some common concepts often have different names. 
So we have clinical research and mathematical relationships. And, and in this domain, we have independent and dependent variables. So an independent variable is free to be whatever it wants, but it determines the value of dependent variables. In epidemiologic research, a variable that predicts an outcome is an exposure. You're exposed to something which may lead to an outcome. You can be exposed to a contaminant, a pollutant, maybe something in your food, and the outcome could be a disease, a cancer, or some other kind of behavior. So again, traditionally, we have independent variables that lead to dependent variables. In epidemiology, these are exposures leading to outcomes. The example that I'm fond of making all the time is that smoking is an independent variable. You are free, you're independent to smoke if you want to, or not smoke if you want to. But the smoking causes a certain outcome, and that outcome could be lung cancer. Now, an exposure that increases or decreases the likelihood for developing a certain outcome or disorder, commonly diseases, we call that a risk factor. Now go back to John Snow again. John Snow discovered that water from this pumping station was likely associated with cholera. He didn't know how it worked. He didn't understand the biology, the mechanism by which water caused the disease. He just knew that this water was a risk factor for getting the disease. And this really is one of the foundations for public health epidemiology. We can measure statistically the relationship between risk factors and outcomes, and thus we can control the risk factors and maybe then control the outcomes without knowing the relationship, without knowing the mechanism of how that risk factor caused the outcome, or in fact, if it was indeed causal. For example, smoking causes lung cancer. We know this because there's a strong statistical association between whether or not you smoke and whether or not you are likely to get lung cancer. You don't have to know the science or the biology or the mechanism of how the smoking causes the lung cancer. It helps, it's useful, we recommend that we figure this out, but we don't have to know in order, to, in order to have a public health intervention epidemiologically. I can control the risk factor and thus reduce the likelihood of the outcome. Sometimes when people say the epidemiology of a disease, what they actually mean is the description of that disease. And that brings us to talking about descriptive epidemiology or a descriptive study. By the way, I don't like it when we say the epidemiology of a disease. It's a, a limiting description of the full breadth and majesty and complexity of what the science of epidemiology brings to the table. But when they say descriptive epidemiology, what we're really talking about is the who, who gets the, a disease or an outcome, the what, what is that they're getting, the where, where is it happening, and when, when is it happening. Notice that there is no why there, just, just four W's, who, what, where, and when. When we're into the why, we're into a deeper kind of investigation. Descriptive epidemiology only cares about describing the who, what, where, and the when. So let's think of uh, an example. Let's, just, let's decide that we're going to investigate the prevalence of left-handedness among students in your neighborhood. Who are we dealing with? Students. What? Left-handedness. Where? The place where you live, your neighborhood. And when? Right now. We care about measuring this uh, prevalence, this distribution right now. And so the thing that I'm measuring, the thing that I'm ascertaining is right now, 23% of students in your neighborhood are left-handed. That's a very simple and relatively useless observation, but a good description of, of descriptive epidemiology. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the way that study designs are taxonomized, how we categorize them. Because a large part of epidemiology is in designing studies to acquire the evidence that fits within our research paradigm. So the first large delineation I want to draw attention to is qualitative versus quantitative studies. In qualitative research, that's the world of social sciences, the world of political science, and sometimes health sciences. That's when we're dealing with descriptions that are qualitative, words, themes, things like that. Quantitative research is in numbers, statistics, and that's where we're going to live. We're going to live in the world of quantitative research and epidemiology. Amongst quantitative studies, we have descriptive versus analytical studies. Now, descriptive studies we've talked about already. That's the who, what, where, and when. 
right? And one example of a descriptive study is a cross-sectional study, which we will describe in, in, in greater depth later. But I just did an example. Left-handedness in my neighborhood. That's a cross-sectional description of a, of a particular phenomenon. When we are looking at two different variables or more variables and how they relate to one another, then we're into the world of analysis, into analytical studies. Now, descriptive studies dealt with one variable, really, describing left-handedness. Analytical studies are looking at two variables or more uh, and a relationship between them. Amongst analytical studies, there are two other categories, observational or experimental. Amongst observational studies, there are three perhaps four large categories, the case control, the cohort, different kinds of cross-sectional studies, and possibly this thing called an ecological study, all of which we'll learn more about in another lecture. The distinguishing characteristic of observational studies is that we observe them. The universe unfolds and we observe. We don't determine who does what or who gets what. All we do is we watch and we marvel in the way that the universe unfolds. Experiments, on the other hand, that's when we do get to interfere a bit. The classical experiment in epidemiology is the randomized control trial, or the RCT, also called clinical trials. There are other kinds of experiments as well. There are quasi-experimental designs, there are natural experiments, and we'll talk about more of those uh, in a future lecture as well. Now, when the layperson thinks about an experiment, they mean any kind of study, any kind of uh, investigation. When epidemiologists talk about an experiment, we mean something very particular. We're talking about when we manipulate a variable. So uh, perhaps we are deciding who gets a drug versus who gets a placebo, or who gets to smoke versus who doesn't smoke. Whenever we are telling people what to do, we are conducting an experiment. We manipulate something. We manipulate a variable. In observational studies, we don't. We let the universe unfold as it would. We let people choose what they're going to do. We may select them based upon what they're doing, but we don't tell them what to do. An experiment involves us changing a variable. Well, now that we've covered uh, the differences between analytical and descriptive studies and the differences between observational and experimental studies, let's look at some historical examples. In particular, I want to talk about the triumphs of epidemiology, one in particular, and it's this. You may recognize this photo. You may recognize this disease. This is smallpox, one of the great scourges of humankind, one of the great burdens of human civilization. And smallpox is particular because it is the first human disease deliberately eradicated by human beings. And we did this in 1980, in large part due to some innovative approaches by epidemiologists, heroes, I would argue. So, as I mentioned, smallpox was uh, defined to be eradicated by the WHO in 1980, but attempts to do so go back decades before then. In 1975, this individual, Rahima Banu, I think she's from Bangladesh, was the last person to contract natural smallpox. And since then, we don't know of any individual who has contracted natural smallpox. So we're pretty confident the smallpox has been eradicated. I'm sufficiently old that I still have a mark on my shoulder from my smallpox vaccine. It left a large mark. But young people today don't have that mark. They don't have that burden because we have eliminated the need for that vaccine. I love this particular quote by Thomas Jefferson in a letter to Edward Jenner in 1806. He says, and the, the, the critical part of this letter is the last sentence, future nations will know by history only that the loathsome smallpox has existed. It's important because Edward Jenner devised the first workable smallpox vaccine in the early 1800s. And Thomas Jefferson implies in his letter that due to that vaccine, we will no longer have a smallpox problem. But it took another 180 years for us to truly eradicate smallpox. So clearly the solution for beating back this disease wasn't simply the technology of vaccination. It was something a little more complicated, more profound, more interesting. And that's where the science of epidemiology came in. It was uh, a need to compute the numbers of people who need to be vaccinated to truly eradicate the disease. And this was made possible because of something called herd immunity. Herd immunity is when individuals in a population 
are immune to a disease and thus prevent other individuals who are not immune from getting contact with that disease. If you think about a herd of cattle, those at the center of the herd will never have any contact with anyone outside of the herd because they're protected by those on the periphery. So long as those on periphery are immune or have been vaccinated, then the ones in the center don't need to be. In other words, not everybody in the herd needs to be vaccinated, just a certain proportion. Epidemiologists stepped in and computed that proportion that was needed to ensure that smallpox would be eradicated. Let's look at the timeline of smallpox in human civilization. Going back centuries, if not millennia, smallpox was a major scourge of humankind. In the 18th century, attempts at finding a treatment made some great progress with Edward Jenner creating the first variolation attempts. But back then, 400,000 people would die every year, at least. It was quite the killer. A third of the survivors, though, became blind, and so they lived on with disability. So it's not just about uh, the disease killing people. It's not just about the mortality. It's also about the morbidity. And it's important that we keep in mind that when we're looking at the impact of disease, it's not just the deaths we care about. It's the effects on the quality of life that matter. The people who survive also developed immunity to smallpox. This is an important consideration when we talk about eradicating the disease. Once you've got it, you're not going to get it again. We can cross you off the list of someone who needs to be inoculated. So Edward Jenner took interest in, in, in cowpox, which was a kind of smallpox that cattle had, and he noticed that uh, people who were milking cows would be exposed to cowpox and tended to be immune to smallpox as a result. So he got the idea that exposure to this particular infection of cowpox may imbue an individual with a kind of immunity to, to smallpox. So in the 1950s, the world took notice that maybe it was time to have a more militaristic administrative attempt to control smallpox globally. In 1967, a decision was made by the WHO to attempt to eradicate and remove this scourge from the human experience altogether. And as I mentioned, in 1980, this was accomplished. WHO had eradicated smallpox entirely. A great triumph. So to review that timeline, in 67, we began the eradication uh, process. And back then, 15 million people were developing smallpox every year. But 2 million died every year. And today, no one dies anymore from smallpox. So... One of the important qualities of epidemiology is through the observational process, we can determine risk factors and likely causes of disease. I say likely causes because I use that word cause very carefully. We'll talk later on about how we define what a causal factor is. But in absence of knowing for sure that something causes something else, we call it a risk factor. And we talk about associations rather than causations. So many times we don't know the cause of a disease, but we can associate it with various exposures. For example, streptococcal infection is often followed by rheumatic fever and sometimes rheumatic heart disease. So we can prevent rheumatic heart disease by preventing streptococcal infection, even if we're not entirely sure what the causal mechanism might be. We know that rheumatic fever is more frequent amongst army recruits than in school children. So now we know the population to focus on and when an intervention is most likely. Lung cancer and smoking is uh, the classic example. It was fought in courts for many years about whether or not tobacco really was a cause of lung cancer, and we're pretty sure that it is. But in absence of solid laboratory evidence, we had mountains of epidemiological observational evidence showing that people who smoked tended to have lung cancer more so than people who didn't smoke. The power of observation in many cases overcomes the need for solid specific causal information. Observational epidemiology is also useful for understanding morbidity and mortality from diseases uh, in the population as a whole. We can associate lifestyle factors like uh, driving without a seatbelt or eating too much fat or having too many calories in our diet or being too immobile and not moving enough with other kinds of negative health outcomes. We don't need to know the mechanism in order to be able to control the outcome by controlling lifestyle choices and risk factors. Let's talk about some of the important tasks that epidemiologists are engaged in. Uh, 
Well, the first and most important thing that a population epidemiologist cares about is disease surveillance. Most modern countries have several complicated surveillance programs in action all the time, including something called a notifiable disease registry. That's when a list of key diseases are made so that any time a health professional encounters one, they must, by law, inform the government or whoever's in charge of that surveillance program that they saw a case. In this way, we have a solid idea of whether or not our country or population has a particular disease. Some of the key ones include tuberculosis or HIV AIDS or even Ebola now has made the list in recent months in most countries. Disease surveillance allows us to detect whether or not an epidemic is happening. It allows us to detect whether or not a disease is changing its profile in a, in a way. And it allows us to predict or detect any time the population is changing its behavior with respect to certain diseases as well. Epidemiologists are also involved in diagnostic tests. We're going to go in, into greater detail on diagnostic tests in a further lecture. But know right now that these tests involve uh, computing things like sensitivity and specificity, deciding whether or not we can use this test in this context or whether or not a test is viable as a screening tool to identify individuals who are good candidates for further investigation further on. Epidemiologists are also useful in trend analysis, and we're going to talk a little bit more about trend analysis in a second. This is when we look at the uh, changes in diseases over time or over populations and try to ascertain some wisdom from looking at the changes in the numbers without actually investigating individual cases. And also, one of the important things that clinical epidemiologists and population epidemiologists do is designing studies. So. Uh, very often, uh, a researcher will contract an epidemiologist to go over their study design and their protocols to make sure that everything is methodologically sound. Now let's look at some of the issues in trend analysis. Here's an example from U.S. data. This is the changes in mortality rates of white women and lung cancer. As you can see, from 1973 to 1995, the mortality rates we're going up dramatically. This is white women in America dying of lung cancer. If you look at black women, well, the rates are kind of the same. So there's no reason to expect white women and black women to be physiologically different, so this is not surprising. If you look at breast cancer, white women, the rates have come down slightly from 1973 to 1995. With black women, they've gone up. That's interesting. Here's all the data in one slide we see that there are no changes or no differences between white and black women except with respect to breast cancer. That's very interesting, and there could be a host of reasons for this observation, including something we call detection bias. That's when we're looking for more cases, so we find more cases. And again, we'll talk more about detection bias in a future lecture about biases. But the point I'm trying to make here is that trend analysis allows us to know what questions to ask, allows us to ascertain that there's probably something happening here that I need to investigate further. So what have we learned as a result of this lecture? Well, you've learned the origins of epidemiology. You know that it began in, in England in the early 19th century with a bit of medical detective work by John Snow. And since then, it's evolved into a host of other realms, including clinical epidemiology and genetic epidemiology and population epidemiology and data science and all these other uh, categories of epidemiology that maybe you're interested in now. Now you can distinguish between descriptive and analytical studies. Descriptive epidemiology, remember, is when we're describing a scenario. We care about the who, the what, the where, and the when. Analytical studies is when we are drawing relationships between two variables. And now you can identify the different types of epidemiologists, the clinical epidemiologists, the population epidemiologists, and the public health epidemiologists. In this lecture, we're going to learn a little bit about critical thinking and evidence-based medicine. And I want to start off by telling you about my first consulting opportunity when I was a, a graduate student learning epidemiology. I was assisting some scientists who were trying to determine if gynecological practice was largely evidence-based. And to do this, we looked through the literature and, and attempted to tell if the things that gynecologists were doing commonly with pregnant women, like shaving their pubic hair and giving them enemas before birth, was worthwhile. We determined it was not worthwhile, so much of these practices weren't evidence-based. 
The problem, though, is that we couldn't convince the gynecologist to stop doing these practices. So the lesson there is, even though things may or may not be evidence-based, clinical practice is still based upon values and experiences. Having said that, today you're going to learn about how to apply epidemiological principles to help you make evidence-based medical decisions. So we're going to learn how to apply the steps of EBM, which is evidence-based medicine. We're going to learn how to rank the different kinds of study designs that you're going to discover in the process of doing your EBM searches. And you're going to learn how to phrase a research question using a method that we call PICO, P-I-C-O. To begin with, I want to show you this image. This is an image that I saw on the subways of Toronto many years ago. Essentially, it says a couple of things. It has two bits of information. The first is that approximately three to five children in every Canadian classroom have witnessed their mother being assaulted. A dire statistic, a little depressing. And the second is that 70% of men in court-ordered treatment for domestic violence witnessed it as a child. Okay, so let's think about what this is actually saying. It's telling us that, obviously, some children are seeing domestic violence at home. That's not a good thing. It's further implying that those children may grow up to be abusers themselves. I don't mean to minimize this issue. It's a serious issue. We should take it very seriously. But I want you to think about those numbers through a new epidemiological lens. What are the numbers actually saying to you? What information is missing? What additional information do you think you need to add a bit more nuance and wisdom to these numbers? First thing is three to five children. Is that a large number? Think about it. What's the denominator? How many children are in the classroom totally? If there are 10 children, then that's 30 to 50% of kids in that class saw domestic abuse. That's a high number, we can agree. That's bad. But if it's 100 kids in the classroom, that's 3 to 5%. Still, one child is bad enough, but 3 to 5% isn't as bad as 30 to 50%. So the denominator matters. The second bit of information is that 70% of men in a court-ordered treatment for domestic violence saw it as a child. Okay, that seems like a large number, but I want you to think about, again, what should we be comparing that to? How many men who weren't in a court-ordered treatment saw it as a child? I don't know the answer, but think about this. Maybe 70% of men in a court-ordered treatment for domestic violence also ate rice pudding at some point in their lives. Is the implication that rice pudding causes you to be a domestic abuser? Again, I don't mean to minimize this issue. My point is, the numbers are meaningless without a control group or denominator. Do you get my point? I hope so. So, epidemiology is a way of thinking. It's a way of uh, adding wisdom to numbers that otherwise are alone in a void without context. And some of the things we do in epidemiology is to critically evaluate published studies using many of the tools that we're going to learn in the course of, of this lecture and other lectures. We're going to identify the biases that may affect the conclusions that we draw from the published evidence. Again, in a, another lecture, we're going to talk more deeply about what those biases are. But I want you to be aware that biases exist. They always exist. The question is, how much do those biases interrupt your ability to make meaningful conclusions that are valid for your practice? And lastly, we're going to assess the qualities of different types of evidence. Not all evidence is the same. Some are ranked more highly than others. And we'll talk a bit about how those rankings occur. So that takes us to evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is not a new idea, but has, it's taken off in recent years. It's become very, very popular. It is the attempt to integrate best research evidence with the clinician's personal experiences and the values of their patients to make, again, meaningful, evidence-based, clinically appropriate choices and decisions for their patients. It's a way to use literature to help you make clinical decisions in a systematic fashion. What does systematic mean? Systematic means that there's a process, there's a list, there's a step-by-step -step procedure to follow by which we assess and collect the best quality evidence and summarize it in a way that answers the clinical question that we are trying to ask. So again, EBM is the application of critical thinking in order to make clinical decisions. So, what's best research evidence? We're trying to summarize the best research evidence to allow us to make clinical decisions. What does that mean? It's clinically relevant research. Sometimes it comes from basic sciences, by which I mean lab sciences, but typically it comes from the medical literature. That is, peer-reviewed literature written by doctors or medical scientists to be consumed by other medical scientists and doctors. What's clinical expertise? 
That's your expertise as a clinician or a doctor or a nurse or some other kind of caregiver. So it's your ability to identify your patient's unique needs and make the evidence that you collect relevant for this particular case that you're interested in. And what's patient values? Just because you find an answer from literature, it doesn't mean it's going to correspond to your patient's needs. For example, maybe your patient has religious beliefs that don't allow him or her to accept the finding that you have found in your research. Or maybe they prefer pain alleviation or lifestyle considerations more so than lifespan elongation. These are things to consider when assessing the evidence and making your final clinical decision. But why is EBM so interesting all of a sudden? It's been around for a long time. It's been around since post-revolutionary Paris. But a couple of things, well, four things in particular, have caused it to, be, to gain a lot more traction in recent years. First is that doctors need daily information about how to conduct their practice, diagnosis, prognosis, therapy, and prevention. That's always been the case, but now doctors are seeing more patients than ever before and are seeing a wider variety of conditions than ever before. So daily information is needed. Second, the textbook that doctors have often relied upon are now out of date. Research is coming in so fast and so furiously and so groundbreaking that very often the textbooks are simply not relevant anymore. There are also too many journals to, to plow through. You haven't got a lot of time to go through them all. So what do you do? Your knowledge as a clinician is going to decline over time. This is the nature of the world. We're all getting older, we're all retaining less information in our brains, and we're knowing a little bit less. We're getting wiser, but we're knowing less. You've got only a few seconds every day to deal with a mountain of evidence in between patients, and you've got about 30 minutes a week that you can set aside to do additional reading to maintain your clinical expertise. Those are all some serious considerations that need a new practice, a new process by which we can interrogate the literature to gain clinical expertise to answer clinical questions. And that takes us to evidence-based medicine. It's essentially a series of strategies for finding and appraising the best quality evidence. It's the appraising part in which the epidemiology really kicks in. How do we decide which evidence is good, which is bad? Bad is not the best word here. Which evidence is good and which evidence perhaps is not as good as others? EBM allows us to look at systematic reviews and to look at summaries for ongoing research. We will define what systematic reviews are in a second, but file that term away in your memory right now. EBM also has spurred the development of evidence-based journals. These journals are now allowing us to do searches that we know are focused on good quality evidence and not just on opinion or one-off studies or things like that. It really shortens the time span between having a question and finding relevant information. We have new information systems now. I'm talking about computers that allow us to search very, very quickly. Imagine doing the kinds of searches I'm going to show you in a second 20, 30 years ago before there were computers. We had to go to libraries and search through stacks of books to find five or six articles. Now we can find hundreds, which is the tough of a key touch of a key, and that's going to change everything. And lastly, we have these new attitudes. New generations of doctors have new attitudes towards lifelong learning that convinces them that they need to be abreast of current information in order to be the best possible clinicians. So here are the steps of EBM, or evidence-based medicine. First is that we need to convert our need for information, whatever it might be, whatever your patient demands, whatever clinical crisis is convincing you that you need to access literature, we need to convert that information into a question. Not just any kind of question, but an answerable research question. And we're going to do this in a second, as an example. The second thing we need to do is we're going to have to search the literature to find the best evidence to answer that question. And again, what is best evidence? Best evidence depends upon the rankings of studies based upon the epidemiology of those particular studies that you find. The third step in EBM is to critically appraise that evidence for its validity, impact, and applicability. We're going to decide if that evidence is in fact worthy of being included in the soup of evidence that will inform the answer to your question. And lastly, we're going to integrate that evidence with your particular clinical expertise. What does that mean? It means that you have wisdom gained from a lifetime spent treating patients or observing patients or doing research that you need to be able to bring to bear on top of all the research that you've currently conducted.
This is because EBM is not simply an automated, mechanical, computerized system that a machine can do. It requires a human being to apply their skill sets plus their wisdom in order to make an appropriate clinical decision. And lastly, we like to evaluate whether or not we've done a good enough job. To be honest, very few practitioners do the evaluation phase, but we encourage you to do so anyway. So let's go through those three conditions that I mentioned just now. Validity, impact, and applicability. What does validity mean? Validity is the closeness to the truth or the real world that the study that you find purports to be. Let me think of an example for you. Let's say you find a study that finds an association, a connection, a relationship between maternal diet and child's intelligence. And they find that mothers who eat a lot of fat have children who grow up to be very, very intelligent. But they measure intelligence via education level. In other words, the highest education that that child achieves is a proxy measurement for that child's intelligence. Now, right away, I hope you see the problem. Just because you have a high education doesn't mean you're intelligent. Just because you have a low education doesn't mean you're not intelligent. So education is an invalid measurement of intelligence. So that study would fail the validity test. A facetious example of a valid measure is to say that a score on an IQ test is a valid measurement of one's ability to write IQ tests. A less facetious example is to say that an ultrasound scan is a very valid test for pregnancy. Impact is important. So you may find a relationship between two factors that's relevant for your question, but is the impact great enough to warrant your interest? And by impact, I mean effect size. Did the subjects in the study change by 5%, 10%, 20%? What's relevant to your particular condition for your patient? And lastly, applicability. You may have found a very relevant study that talks about something very similar to the questions you're asking it, but is it applicable to your case? Maybe the studies you found were done on young men and your patient is an older woman. You have to ask yourself, is that distinction important for your particular circumstance? So let's talk about now some of the studies that you might find. And in another lecture, we're going to go further in detail into the qualities of these studies and why some might be more uh, causal or of higher quality than others. The first is the RCT, or the Randomized Controlled Trial. This is when you've got a group of patients that have been randomly allocated into two groups. One group receives a treatment, and the other group receives a placebo, or control. This is considered to be the gold standard of evidence because we can reliably test for causal relationships. Did this treatment cause that outcome? We like to find RCTs. RCTs make us excited. The next two studies are going to be cohort and case control studies. These are what we call observational studies. We don't interfere in the variables of an observational study. Instead, we watch them unfold in the universe naturally. The first observational study is the cohort design. That's when we find some people who have been exposed to something of interest, some other people who haven't been exposed, and we look forward in time to see the proportions in each of those groups that determine an outcome. Similarly, a case control is also an observational study, but it's backwards. It's the opposite of a cohort study. That's when we ascertain which patients have the outcome we care about, those are the cases. We find some other patients who don't have that outcome. Those are the controls. We look back in time to see who had the exposures of interest. And again, we're going to go in greater detail into these designs in a future lecture. Case series are a poor quality of evidence. They are descriptions of individual patients. And very often, there's no control group involved. A case report is one instance. Several reports make up a case series. Systematic reviews, on the other hand, are considered to be very good evidence depending upon the studies that are included in them. A systematic review is a summary of literature of several studies that have been brought together to answer a larger question. Related to systematic review is a meta-analysis, and some people confuse the two. Some people will use the term meta-analysis and systematic review interchangeably, but they are distinct concepts. A meta-analysis is when we take the summaries or the estimates from a variety of studies and mathematically synergize them all, if that's a word. We make one estimate from all of them, mathematically. A systematic review 
doesn't necessarily do that. So a systematic review can include a meta-analysis, but it doesn't have to. So those are the six basic large categories of study types that we will find in our search. Again, the RCT is the gold standard. A systematic review of RCTs might even be better. So what do we do with all this information now? We're going to use our well-phrased research question to search for evidence, to search for which studies are relevant to the question that we care about. And we're going to apply what's called the pyramid of evidence to determine which studies we should perhaps give more weight to because they're probably better. There are many ways to create an evidence pyramid, but they all sort of agree on several key features. I want you now to guess about where certain kinds of studies may rank on our evidence pyramid, where at the very top we have our best quality evidence, and at the bottom we have our least quality evidence. So in vitro test tube research, where do you think that is? It's at the bottom. It's not very good evidence. How about case series? I've already mentioned it's not great evidence, it's somewhere in the middle. Randomized controlled trials, we think, are among the gold standard, the very best in the world, so you know they're on top. What do you think of animal research? We'll put it down here. How about systematic reviews and meta-analyses? Well, if you guessed on top, you're right, because a systematic review made up of randomized controlled trials is probably better than an individual randomized control trial. How about case reports? Well, they're up there with case series. Cohort and case controls are observational studies, and they're near the top as well. And then we have opinions, and they're near the bottom. Now, in practice, we tend to like systematic reviews and randomized control trials a lot. When pressed, we will include some observational studies as well. We almost never go beneath the case control but sometimes we have to. Now, there are different ways of phrasing or making an evidence pyramid. I like this one. This puts expert opinion at the bottom and systematic reviews and RCTs at the top. Now, consider your personal experience, whether you're watching government debates or things in the media. What really wins the day? It's not randomized controlled trials and it's not systematic reviews. It's actually personal and expert opinion. People's opinions carry a lot of weight in public, but in science, it's the experiments and the systematic reviews of experience that carry weight. So remember, when dealing with policy, we like to invert the pyramid sometimes. Okay, now we're going to ask the research question. This seems like it should be a straightforward, easy thing to do, but professionals who conduct systematic reviews or do EBM searches will spend a great amount of time focusing on phrasing the question as precisely as possible. The more focused and precise the phraseology, the more correct and targeted the result of the search will be. There are many ways to phrase a research question correctly. I like to use a method called the PICO method, P-I-C-O, and those letters stand for certain things. The P stands for patient population. So who's your patient population? Who's your patient? What are his or her needs or cohorts? The I stands for interventions. What action are you considering? The C stands for a comparison or a control group. What are you comparing them to? And lastly, the O is outcome. What is it that you're trying to change or accomplish? What's the disease state you're measuring? So, there are many different kinds of questions we could be asking as well. There are at least four. One of them is therapeutic. Maybe you want to know what treatments are available that lead to certain kinds of outcomes for your patient. Maybe you want to know about how best to diagnose a patient's condition. Maybe you want to know about how likely is the patient going to have certain kinds of outcomes, their prognosis. Or maybe you want to know what's the relationship between the disease and its possible cause, in other words, a measurement of harm. So let's do an example. A doctor wants to research the effects of dietary fat on breast cancer risk. Maybe this doctor has a middle-aged female patient who has a family history of breast cancer, and she wants to minimize her risk in all possible ways going forward because she knows it's in her family history. So she knows about the genetic portion of breast cancer. Now she wants to know a little bit more about the behavioral aspects of breast cancer. And she wants to know whether removing dietary fat from her behavior will gain her any kind of an advantage going forward in not acquiring breast cancer like her mother did. So what do you do? 
you're going to search the literature. You're going to employ EBM methods to do so. You're going to do so by phrasing an appropriate question. Let's use the PICO method. Patient population? Well, it's going to be adult women because your patient is an adult woman. The intervention you care about is dietary fat. That's the thing that's going to make the change. The comparison group you care about? Well, there isn't really one. We're comparing adult women to themselves, really. And the outcome we care about is breast cancer. Note that the comparison group here is empty. That's quite common. The PICO method has some flexibility to it. The type of question you're asking is an etiologic one. You're looking for uh, relationships between exposures and outcomes. That's relevant when you're looking through the studies that you find to see what their focus is. Is their focus a description? Is it etiologic? Is it behavioral? Is it opinion? And you'll take any kind of study at this point, even though you know at the end of the day you're going to apply the evidence pyramid and try to pick the best quality evidence. So here's your question then. In adult women, is dietary fat a risk factor for breast cancer? That's the PICO outcome. Now, you may think that you could have gotten that answer yourself without going through the PICO process, and that's fine, but some people need a framework to help them phrase these kinds of questions. So what do you do now? You actually apply the search. There are lots of search engines you could go to. So one of them is PubMed, and that's a free search engine run by the uh, American government. And you can type in the appropriate keywords, dietary fat treatment. You can go to Google Scholar and type in keywords as well. There are literally scores of possible search engines to try. World Science, for example. So at the end of all this, what you will find is a host of studies that attempt to answer the question that you have phrased using the PICO method. You're going to apply the period of evidence to establish which studies are most relevant to your case, and from that you will apply your particular clinical expertise and extract a bit of wisdom that you can take to your patient. So, what have we learned? We've looked at how to do the steps of evidence-based medicine. We've looked at how to rank the kinds of studies that result from your search using EBM methods. And you've used the PICO method to phrase a research question to allow you to undertake an EBM literature search. Mm -hmm.